Hey everybody, I wanted to take this as an opportunity to walk through all the questions that were on exam number one that we just took in uh, Chem 4375. I want this to be available for you all later on in the semester when we're preparing for the final. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to go through the questions, how they were uh, presented, what were the right answers, what were some of the wrong answers, and why. Um, and how do you actually address these problems of the future. Okay, so hang tight. The first question here is, what is a C3 epimer of allose? Now, a couple of things that you need to do right off the bat is you need to know what allose looks like. And I'm going to draw a linear form of allose. And what allose is, is a hexose, an aldohexose. So it has three, four, five, six carbons. And if we were talking about D allose, L allose, it doesn't really matter. But for the sake of this demonstration, I'm going to show what uh, D allose is. D allose is going to have our hydroxide group on our penultimate carbon on the right hand side. Allose is kind of an easy one to remember in particular because of all. All of the hydroxide groups on allose are on the right hand side of the molecule. So OH at carbon number two, OH at carbon number three, and OH at carbon number four. What this question is asking about specifically is, well, what is the C3 epimer of allose? And to answer that question, you have to know, first of all, where is carbon number three? And carbon number three is right here. So what? Is, so once you've determined that, what does that epimer actually look like? Well, that molecule is going to look like this. And I'm just gonna draw CHO, COH, 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 OH, that gives us five carbons, CH2OH. Okay, so there is our epimer of allose. And in order to figure this out, what you need to be able to do is, so when you look at this molecule, this, this epimer of allose that we've drawn, what I want you to recognize is where are our hydroxide groups? Carbon number two is on the right-hand side, carbon number three is on the left-hand side, and carbon number four is on the right-hand side. Now, this is not something you'll be able to, do. you will not be able to answer this question without knowing your aldoses, and specifically your aldohexoses. Um, but if you know those and know the relationships between those sugars, the first thing that you'll do is you'll recognize this as glucose. So the correct answer for this question is C, glucose. Now I would make the argument that glucose is an essential sugar that you really should know both the linear and cyclized forms of it um, because it's gonna follow you through metabolism in every class basically that, that succeeds this one. So that's the you know rough way of answering this one. You have to know it. Okay. Now this next question is what is the C2 epimer of xylulose? Now, what I want you to recognize about this is, or what I need you to remember about this, is that this is a ketose. So whenever you write this out, carbon number one, CH2OH, carbon number two is your carbonyl group, carbon number three is OH on the right-hand side, number four is OH on the right-hand side, and carbon number five is H2OH. So to complete this molecule, boom, boom. Well. This one is actually not intended to be a trick question, but the purpose is for you to recognize which carbons you're talking about and for what purposes. So this is asking about a C2 epimer of xylulose. Well, carbon one, two, three, four, five. Well, carbon number two, the, can we make an epimer of this? So could we put this carbonyl group on the other side? Sure, but that doesn't change the sugar. And so the answer to this question is A, this does not exist. So it doesn't change it into some other sugar or anything like that. The next question asks us, which of the following pairs is interconverted in the process of mutorotation? Now, when you look at these different answer options, glucose, fructose, okay, so answer option A is looking at D-glucose versus D-fructose. B is looking at alpha D glucose and beta D glucose. C is D glucose and, D and L glucose. D is D glucose and D galactose. E is D allose and D altrose and L altrose. I'm sorry. 
Now, if you look at answer options A, C, D, and E, well, we're changing some of the sugars. And if you look at and compare answer options C and E, well, those are both a D sugar to an L sugar. So if one of those is right, they both have to be right, which is a good way to discriminate and consider that this is not a good answer. So C and E are out. Now, if you compare D fructose and D gl uh, glucose and D glucose and D galactose, well, we're talking about an epimer as well as a different type of sugar. So um, A is an aldose versus a ketose, and D is looking at an epimer. Well, our question is all about mutorotation. You have to know what that term is. And if you remember what that term is, it gives us a little bit of insight into, well, what does a sugar actually look like? So we've got two forms of glucose, CH2OH, down, up, down. CH2OH, OH, 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 and up. Okay, so to evaluate this question, I mean, we've kind of canceled it out that our, our correct answer is A, alpha and beta D glucose, but why? Well, what we have to do here is identify our anomeric carbons, and that is carbon number one for both of these sugars. Now, alpha versus beta is going to help us delineate, well, is that hydroxide group going up or hydroxide group going down? And what we need to do is we need to compare that to carbon number six. In both cases, carbon number six is above our ring. So here it is, and here it is. Now, our hydroxide group, is it going up or is it going to down? That's ultimately going to tell us the difference between an alpha and a beta sugar. Now, what we've got going on here is whenever our hydroxide group is going up like this, well, that's going to be our beta. When it's going down, that is our alpha sugar. So what happens is basically this anomeric carbon is a new chiral center, and the movement of this hydroxide group going down or going up is going to flip between our alpha and our beta glucose there. So you have to be, a, to answer this question correctly, you have to be able to identify an anomeric carbon. You have to be able to recognize the relative positioning of those hydroxide groups with respect to the ring, as well as respect to uh, carbon number six in both cases. So that's how you would answer this question. Now, this question right here pertains to your linear monosaccharides. In a monosaccharide, whether it is the D or L sugar is determined by the A, fifth carbon, B, penultimate carbon, C, last carbon, D, first carbon, or E, it varies from sugar to sugar. Okay, so now our best answer options there. I would say that both, car or both answer options C and D are equally right as they are equally wrong. Our fifth carbon, lots of people like this as an answer option because they're accustomed to looking at their aldo hexoses. And so a hexose, a six carbon molecule, sure enough, the L versus D designation is determined by carbon number five. However, if you look at something like an aldo tetros or an aldo uh, pentose, well then what you have to do is you have to look at that second to last or that penultimate carbon. So that is the correct answer for that, or for that question. Now this to me is kind of a fun question. It asks, you've recently, or it gives you a, a, a scenario. You've recently started working in a research lab and you found a new restriction enzyme. Okay, so we've got a new restriction enzyme. To determine some characteristics of this enzyme, you produced a randomly, gener or you randomly generated a new piece of DNA. Now, what I like about this is that right there, a random piece of DNA. And this piece of DNA is 65,536 base pairs long. You let your enzyme incubate with your DNA molecule for one hour and then return to evaluate this piece of DNA on a gel and find that this piece of DNA is cut exactly one time. Based on this restriction enzyme cutting at this frequency, 
what is the length of your restriction enzymes recognition sequence so what you should look at is you should look at this as the cutting frequency is once every 65,536 base pairs okay so you cut one time now this question is asking well how long of a recognition sequence are you going to get that will cut that frequently and the way that you can answer this question is kind of reverse engineer it so if we think about generating a random piece of dna and our think about our chances of generating a random piece of dna that is simply the nucleotide a well there is a one in four chance that we will do that okay what if we do a t well it's a one in four chance for the a and then subsequently one in four chance for the t now a t c g it's one in four for the a one in four for the t one in four chances of getting the c and one in four for the g so what we're looking at here is how frequent will we randomly find atcg well that's one in four times one in four is one in 16 times one in four is one in 64 and then when you combine the probabilities of all of these it's one in four times one in four times one in four times one in four which gets us one in four times six, over 64 I'm sorry, 1 in 64 times 1 in 4, which is equal to 1 in 256. Okay, so if we use this logic, basically what we're doing is we're confronting a situation where we need to get to this number right here, 1 in 256. So let's go back to the math that we used to arrive at this 256. So 1 in 4 repeated. A total of eight times so if we did one in four to the sixth that's one every 40 96 one in four to the eighth that is one every 65 536 that's what we're looking at right there so the answer to this question, you have to do the math and the, uh, the probabilities of finding an A, T, C, G, followed by X, 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 X. And the answer to that question ultimately ends up as A, eight base pairs. So our recognition sequence is eight base pairs long, and we kind of squared that away with this math right here. Okay, on to the next one. Now, this is a little bit related to the previous question, but it can kind of be independent. In order to investigate your restriction enzyme, you decide to evaluate the resulting piece of double-stranded DNA and find that all the hydrogen bonds within your molecule are intact. What does this tell you? Answer option A, and keep in mind this is a restriction enzyme, a restriction endonuclease, so it's going to cut phosphodiester bonds. Um, so your restriction enzyme produces blunt ends, your restriction enzyme produces sticky ends. Your restriction enzyme has DNA repair capabilities. D, your restriction enzyme is a type two restriction enzyme. Okay, so looking at all these different answer options, let's get our definitions. So if this is our starting material and we cut straight through there, if we come up with blunt ends, we have products that look like this compared to if we have sticky ends, or we have products that look like this. There are, when we talk about sticky ends, we've got these overhangs, complementary overhangs. Now what's unique about those complementary overhangs is that otherwise we would have hydrogen bonding there between those base pairs. So in terms of A or B, by knowing the definition of sticky ends, we can quickly eliminate that as an answer option, leaving behind only blunt ends as a feasible option. So the other two answer options, your restriction enzyme has DNA repair capabilities. Just in terms of probabilities and best answer options, that's one that you could discriminate on. 
Um, your restriction enzyme is a type 2 restriction enzyme. Well, type 1, type 2, and type 3 restriction enzymes, all that they pertain to is uh, recognition sequence and the requirement or the utilization of ATP in that reaction. Okay, now, so this question, the three temperature steps of PCR, which are cycled over and over again, are carried out at different temperatures, 98 degrees, followed by 55, and followed by 72 degrees. Of these three steps, at which temperature is the new piece of DNA actually synthesized? Okay, so in order to do this question, you have to know what's taking place at each subsequent step. So at 98 degrees, we have the denaturation, or the separation step. So we have a double-stranded piece of DNA that we separate into two individual single strands. At 55 degrees, we have the annealing step, the annealing or hybridization, at which point we have a primer bind to each of our two strands of DNA. Then finally, our third step is polymerization. At this step, our DNA polymerase is going to bind to our double-stranded pieces of DNA and begin synthesizing our new strands. So the answer to this question is C, 72 degrees. Okay, so... I dropped something. So this question is, which of the following is not a bond, fa bond found between the individual glucose subunits in a glycogen molecule? Well, to answer this question, you have to know a little bit about glycogen, and you also have to know a little bit about cellulose. So cellulose versus glycogen. What we have here are two different... Um, large polymers of glucose? Well, to answer this question, only alpha bonds, alpha 1,4 and alpha 6, are found within glycogen. Beta 1,4 bonds are the linkages that are found in cellulose molecules. So this one's kind of simple and there's not too much around that. Um, remember a glycogen molecule looks like this with branches and branches of branches and these branches are alpha one six these on the straight chain are alpha one four um, so that one's a little bit tricky you just have to have this material kind of knowledge of this material and contrast these two molecules so which of the following this question is which of the following is not an aldose and this is you should become familiar with quite a few of the different aldoses and ketoses. And one of the most common ketose that you will talk about is fructose. And so erythrose, glucose, glyceraldehyde, and ribose are all examples of aldoses. So the correct answer to this one is fructose. Now this question caused a little bit of confusion between, or for some folks, but one thing that I would want to draw to your attention is structures. Comparing the structures of the nitrogenous bases which bases are most alike. And so what you can do is you can look at the classes of molecules. They are purines and pyrimidines. Now your purines are A and G and your pyrimidines are C, T, and U. Okay, so what we're looking for are molecules or nitrogenous bases that would basically fall into that same category because the key word here is structures when we're looking at the structures of these bases and so the answer is c a and g and one way you could think about that is eggs are pure um, there are any number of other uh, mnemonics and devices like that to to memorize these or learn these but that's one that sticks in my mind because i don't know texas a&m and everything like that Okay, next up is dideoxyribonucleotide chain termination is a method of. Okay, so what is this dideoxy? Whenever you see deoxyribonucleotides, what you should think about is DNA. This is a molecule where you do not have a two prime, so no two prime OH group. When you see dideoxy, 
Well, then you should think there is no 2 prime OH group and no 3 prime OH group. So what that means is you have a sugar that has no 2 prime or 3 prime OH group. And one thing that should come to mind is any time that you're talking about synthesizing a piece of DNA, you need that 3 prime OH group for for nucleic acid, I'm just going to write Na synthesis. Because we have those phosphodiester bonds that connect the two, three prime carbon to the five prime carbon. And so this is a particularly unique circumstance where you have no two prime or no three prime OH group. And what this all relates back to is sequencing of DNA. This is the chain terminator reaction where you have basically a reaction halted anytime there is a molecule that has no three prime OH group introduced. Between the sugars of DNA and RNA, what type of bond holds the molecule together? Okay, so this question asks specifically about the sugars. It goes on between DNA and RNA. Now, one thing that you can, one clue that you can take away from this is RNA generally, RNA is single stranded, single stranded RNA. Okay, DNA is double stranded, or double stranded DNA. So, what this is talking about is what is the bond that holds each of those sugars together? And to answer that question, well, are we using hydrogen bonds? No, we're not. Hydrogen bonds hold the nitrogenous bases together. Glycosidic linkages, well, those hold sugars together, but not necessarily in this case, because what we have between them is a phosphate group. Um, so that takes glycosidic linkages and N-glycosidic linkages off the table, leaving us with nothing but phosphodiester linkages or phosphodiester bonds. Um, the key here is what is the linkage or what is the bond between those different sugars? Now this question is kind of a explicit question. What is the single letter code for the amino acid glutamic acid? Well that is simply going to be E. You have to know your single letter codes, you have to know your three letter codes, and you have to know the names and structures of all of your 20 amino acids that we'll talk about in this class. What is the three letter code for the amino acid tryptophan? Well, there are a couple different options. Um, B is an attractive answer because, oh, it's got that Y in there. TTO, I don't really know how that's attractive. TRYP, that has four letters in it, so that's obviously off the table when we're talking about a three letter code. Han, Han, that's off the table. So really we're down to TRP and TYP. This is ultimately an explicit question. You have to know these. So your three letter code for tryptophan is none other than TRP. Now this question right here, draw a titration curve for the amino acid R. You'll be given one point for clearly labeling your X and Y axis. So what we need to do is we need to know the structure of arginine. And as I've stated time and time again in class, I always like to draw my amino acids at a very acidic pH. So H3N plus C, C, O, H, H, CH2, 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 N, H, C, H2, N, double bonded, N, H2. Okay, so ultimately we've got a couple of different charges. There's a positive charge, there's a positive charge, and here's our carboxylic acid that has no charge at this point in time. So one of the things that I wanted you guys to be familiar with was to recognize the groups that are ionizable. However, one of the other details that I wanted to include was um, if there was a pKa group, and you do not have to memorize those pKa's, but they'll instead be provided for you. So when we're talking about arginine, we have a, an R group that has a pKa of 12.48. We have a C termini that has a pKa of 2.01, and an N termini that has a pKa of 9.04. Okay, so what that means is we have a total of 
0 0.5. We have a total of three groups that are ionizable, so I'm going to go ahead and draw out my x-axis to indicate that. 2, 2.0, 2.5, 3.0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. I guess we can get it all the way up there. Okay, so my first point, my first uh, point along this titration curve is 2.01, 0 0.5. I'm going to make that dot right there. The next one is 1.5. That corresponds to my N termini. That would be 9.04. I'm going to make that dot right there. And then my final one, my 2.5, is 12.48. So there we go. Okay. Now, as I draw this curve, I've got something that looks like this. Increase along that 1.0, increase along that 2.0, and then increase along 3.0. Okay, so there's my titration curve. The last thing that I need to do is label my axes, pH, and then OH minus equivalence. Okay, so these are the groups that you need to be concerned with. This question does not ask us to draw this amino acid any other pH. Instead, it just tells us, well, what does the titration curve for this amino acid look like? We have three points that we need to be sure that we observe and know where they are. That's about it. This next amino acid asks us to, or I'm sorry, this next question asks us to draw the predominant form of the following peptide, tyrosine histidine aspartic acid at a pH of 6.5. So I see a typo, but that's not the case on the exam, so it's hyphenated. So tyrosine is N, C, C, N, C, C, N, C, C. Let's go ahead and fill this in at our proper pH. Fill in our alpha carbons as well as our peptide bonds. H3 plus. I'm going to go ahead and draw this at a um, acidic pH, and then I'll make modifications as needed. CH2 dash tyrosine. We've got that hydroxide group on the end. Um, histidine. What we're going to do there. The histidine, we've got to draw CH2. And we got. And H, we've got double bonds in here. There's one, there's two, positive charge. And then finally, our aspartic acid, CH2, COH. Okay, so the next thing that we have to do is appreciate what groups are ionizable and at what, uh, what are our pKs. So our N termini is most certainly ionizable, and we have to look at the, the N termini for tyrosine. That has a pK of 9.11. Tyrosine has an R group that's ionizable, that's 10.07. Histidine has an R group that is ionizable at a pKa of 6.10. Aspartic acid is also ionizable at 3.86. And then what is our C termini for aspartic acid? That happens to be 2.10. Okay, so here are all of the groups that are ionizable. What we are looking at is we want to look at this molecule at a pH of 6.5. So what we can do is simply look at what groups are, what groups have pKa's that are below and above that. Okay, and termini, that's going to be unchanged. The R group for tyrosine is also going to be unchanged. What is going to be changed, however, is, and I'm going to do these in green, underline them in green, 6.10, 3.86, and 2.10. So what we can do is go ahead and erase the presence of that group on our C termini. I'm going to put a negative charge in there. For our aspartic acid, we're also getting rid of our negative charge. For the histidine, I'm going to get rid of this hydrogen here. And 
as a result I get rid of that that positive charge so this is our peptide that we're looking for what is the overall charge it's not asked for on this question we're not also not asked for a, uh, a titration curve or anything like that but what is the overall charge of this molecule C termini has a minus one charge the aspartic acid has a minus one charge histidine has no charge tyrosine has no car charge the n termini of the tyrosine has a plus one charge so the overall charge of this and once again this is not asked for on the question but the overall charge of this molecule is minus one we have uh, two different groups that are negatively charged two groups that are no charge and one group that is positively charged so the positive one cancels out one of the negative ones and there you have it so these questions right here I, I need to scroll out the numbering there because that's not accurate for our exam this is question number 18 this is question 19 and the point totals are also inaccurate um, for this question I accepted any number of different answer options uh, I'm just gonna write a couple of answer options for the actually the next uh, four questions but this question number 18 which pair or pairs of the above molecules are epimeric so what we're looking for here are simply which ones are epimers now if we look at answer option a well that is the sugar allose so what we are looking for is a sugar that has one variation and if we look a compared to B well you've got a couple of different variations but most directly looking at a and C those are epimers these are uh, C3 epimers and actually if you remember we saw a question very similar to this um, which pair or pairs are enantiomers now if you think about an enantiomer what are we looking for when we're looking for epim or I'm sorry what are we looking for when we're looking for enantiomers well we are looking for mirror images so if we look at one sugar is there another one in here that can provide an obvious mirror image well a has all the hydroxide groups on one side and there actually aren't any other sugars in this group that would have that same thing if you look at B one thing that stands out to me about answer option B is first of all that is an L sugar okay so what I'm looking for is a D variation of that and if I compare B and C what I see is that well for number one or I'm sorry for carbon number two four and five our hydroxide groups are on the left hand side carbon three the hydroxide group is on the right hand side if you look at C two four and five have hydroxide groups on the right hand side carbon three has a hydroxide group on the left hand side so B and C are enantiomers are these the only epimers and enantiomers among this group no but these are two examples these three questions again we got to change the the numbering as well as the point totals and that was reflected on your exam um, this first question is asking you which molecules contain a piranocide and the answer to that is actually all three of them a B and C um, I went ahead and I accepted if you wrote a and B but the key here is what we're looking for is a pyranose with well a glycosidic linkage some people wrote A and C which would I accepted because A and C both have pyranocides um, but B does as well and some people only wrote B because I think they were they were mistaken by this five membered ring here um, so that's the answer to that question that was question number 20 21 which of the above molecules are reducing sugars so anytime you're looking for a reducing sugar you want to look for a free anomeric carbon so a free anomeric carbon and so when we look at our anomeric carbons or look for our anomeric carbons that's one thing that we have to investigate so if you look at answer option a you have a free anomeric carbon right here answer option B okay when we look at look for our anomeric carbons this one right here on our, our uh, pyranose sugar that is involved in our glycosidic linkage if we look at the furanose that anomeric carbon is also involved in the glycosidic linkage one or some people mistook this for being an anomeric carbon that is not the anomeric carbon um, and then answer option C we've got the same thing here's our anomeric carbon here's our other anomeric carbon so C and B are both off the table 
and we are left with only answer A as being correct for being reducing sugars because that has a free anomeric carbon that can react with another, car uh, another sugar so that you can form a longer chain. Which of the following molecules contain at least one alpha anomer? Okay, so when we think about our alpha anomers, um, or so with this last question, question number 22, which of the above molecules contains at least one alpha anomer? What we wanna see here is we wanna see a sugar that looks like this, CH2OH. OH and carbon number one going down. It really doesn't matter where my other hydroxide groups are, but the key is on my anomeric carbon, I need this hydroxide group going downward compared to carbon number six being upward above the, the, the ring structure. Okay, so if we look at answer option A, I'm gonna erase what I've previously drawn, and done, 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 okay. When I look at answer option A, what do I have? I've got my C6 above the ring, and I've got this hydroxide group actually going upward. It's kind of funny to look at that, but that is one way that we described how a sugar can look and how that is represented, this kind of curly Q sort of glycosidic linkage. Now, that le rules that out. So this is not an alpha, or an, an, an alpha sugar. If we look at uh, the second part of this, because this is a disaccharide, our second sugar has our hydroxide group going upward, which makes that this is a beta. So both are beta sugars here, okay? Now, answer option B, what do we have? We have our anomeric carbon with our hydroxide group going downward. So B actually fits the billing for at least one alpha anomer. So we can move on from there. C, we've got our anomeric carbon, and lo and behold, our hydroxide group is going down. So B and C were the correct answers for this. Um, and that pretty much sums up this first exam. The grades were pretty good. Uh, there were some that kind of bounced around a little bit, but um, I'm going to give the exams back, and if you have any questions about the grading, feel free to ask me. Um, but other than that, use this video for consultation and use this video in the future for uh, prepping for the final exam. Thank you very much. I appreciate you watching. Have a good one.